Hi, Richard. How are you? Uh, very well, Douglas. Good to be with you today. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I see your uh, guitars and your piano back there. You a musician, yeah? Uh, yes, I am. Oh, uh, somewhat. Cool. What do you play? <laughs> what what sort of music? Uh, I go back to um, most mostly seventies acoustic uh, ah, and some you, electric. You and guitar. I are kind of in the same genre music wise. I think there was a great explosion of individuality at that time that was really great for the artist. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was the 60s and 70s was probably the best music. Uh, it's what I still listen to. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. All right, great. Well, maybe sometime we can have you back on. Do you write your own compositions or? Uh, no, I do not. I just I just play that of others. Oh, okay. Uh, who who would you who do you play? Who, who uh, Jim Cro Jim Croce and Gordon Lightfoot. Oh, some, okay. Neil, some Neil Young. All right, James Taylor. Uh, not him. Uh, Cat Stevens. Cat Stevens. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Well, all right. Well, we'll have to uh, maybe have you back some other time and do music. Sure. Talk. At Love this to. point, you're here to promote your book. And your book is called The DNA of Democracy, correct? Right. Okay. Interesting topic. Uh, actually, the first question that came to mind when I saw the title of your book was I wanted you to define the difference between a democracy and a republic. Because the United States is a republic and people, I think, confuse the two terms all the time because I hear people saying, oh, the United States is a democracy. And well, no, technically it's a republic, right? At the federal level, it is a republic. Um, America was, we, we get the republic nature of our government from the Romans. Um, we gain, how, how America was founded was, was locally and in the town in the town format or in the local format, we're all set up as democracies. We're at, at, when you get to the state level, it's representative. And again, at the federal level, it's representative because our country spans so much space and contains so many people. Direct democracy would be uh, full of havoc um, and, and subject to passions. And, and the Athenians knew that, and that ultimately is what overthrew them. Um, but we have, we have a, a trifurcated, you could say, system of government in that um, at the local level, we're a demos or a democracy. Uh, at the state level, we're a, we're a representative government or a republic, and also at the federal level. Also at the federal level, we're, we're something of a confederation of states, and that descends from our uh, exposure to the Iroquois Indian League. Oh, okay. Well, that, I didn't know that, but that's good. To know. Yeah. Uh, our system, at, uh, our first confederational system was set up based on the Iroquois League and the combinations of their uh, tribes oh, okay. and their governance. So essentially the difference between a republic and a democracy is that a republic is elected representatives to represent the people. And in a democracy in the truest sense would be the actual people doing the work. Is that correct? Right. Everybody votes singly and, and everybody is a part of government. In, in Greece, in Athens, uh, you, you had the full right uh, to vote, you had the full right to speak, and you were on a jury of between 500 and 5,000 persons who adjudicated every afternoon on, on different trials uh, that were current in the day. That's a direct democracy. Republic, uh, a republic is a species of democracy in that people are represented but they send representatives rather than uh, having a vote themselves. What do you think the maximum number of people in a community would be to make an effective democracy? Because obviously, where we have 360 million people in this country, <laughs> right? You know, you couldn't get everybody in the same room. But uh, how, what would you think, like less than 100, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, they never, the Athenians, uh, neither the Athenians nor uh, our founding fathers ever conceived of a democracy being of too great a number of people. They thought 10,000 was a lot. Um, so that was never conceived of. 
what the reason in the founding of the country with the constitution that they they graduated from local democracy to state and federal republicanism is because of the vast number of persons uh so so their their solution was to have a demos elect a representative who would be uh in the federal government uh together with other representatives of other states what do you think of this idea of of eliminating the electoral college um i think it's one of the great uh mechanisms of genius that is in the constitution uh the electoral college ensures when well let's go back to the founding of the country douglas when the country was founded virginia had the foremost representation of any state in the collection of states compared to Rhode Island, compared to Delaware, it was absolutely massive. And most of the influential people came from there. Their economy was the greatest. The numbers in their population was the most. They, we created or they created the Electoral College in order that neither Virginia, nor Pennsylvania, nor New York, nor any collection of those few states could dominate at the uh, executive level of the federal government uh, in determining who would be president. The Electoral College ensures that persons of all the states are represented. The people that have been advocating the uh, dismantling of the Electoral College tend to not buy into the argument that California and New York would simply control the presidential election if we did I if, if you took those two states and added Illinois and either Texas or Florida, they would absolutely control in every election right. uh, the, the one office that is nationally elect elected, uh, which is the presidency. Because you couldn't get enough population combined with all the other you, states, right? You would, you would never be able to get to that point. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's actually, it's a mechanism of great genius. Uh, and they thought of it, you know, 250 years ago, which is quite remarkable. Oh, I agree. I agree with you. So tell us a bit about your book. Give us kind of a synopsis. Okay, of sure. The, the book is, I, I noticed that persons in America don't really know um, fundamentally, what, fundamentally what democracy is and how, how our democracy or our republic was formed, where it came from. So to discover the DNA of democracy, which is the cr critical code for what a democracy is, I went all the way back uh, to Israel and the Ten Commandments. That was the first time where law was placed above a people. The idea of law being something everyone is answerable to, even the king. From there, I stepped over to uh, the, the Greek uh, democracies, and namely Athens, and what happened in Athens was uh, they had a tyrant there called Isagoras, and they had a democracy set up in fundamentals, but Isagoras decided to, to disproperty uh, half the population by claiming half the population was cursed. And of course, the cursed population was not his friends, and it was not his family, and it was not the persons who would help him to defend his tyranny. Uh, so what happened in, in Athens was that Cleisthenes and his uh, confederation of people decided to storm uh, the Acropolis, which at the time was uh, occupied by a mercenary Spartan army that had never been defeated before in history. And it was an instance where the people of Athens took over their own government and turned it into a democracy where everyone uh, would be represented whose views would be equal and uh, uh, represented. I go from there to Rome, which, which coincidentally at the same time founded its republic. And there again, a tyrant uh, created a crucible of tyranny that had to be overthrown. And it was overthrown by Brutus. You might remember the Brutus of uh, Julius Caesar. Sure. This is his ancestor, Junius Brutus from a time uh, when Rome was founded as a, as a representative government. So from Rome, all right, from, from, from Israel, we gained the Ten Commandments. From Athens, we gained the Athenian Constitution. And from Rome, uh, owing to this crucible of tyranny, we gain uh, the 12, um, oh, what's the name of it? 
the 12 tables. The 12 tables are the very foundation of our system of uh, uh, law passing down from the Romans. I go from Rome to England where in 1215 another crucible occurred of tyranny under King John. King John was ruled his people uh, in a manner that was uh, barbaric. Uh, there was a system at the time that if you wanted to keep your people in control, you created a hostage situation where you would take their children or their nieces and nephews and you would hold them in, in, a royal, uh, in a royal captive keep in order to secure that the noblemen would do what you told him to do. Uh, John went after uh, the children of a woman called Matilda de Bruise. Uh, she defended her children, overthrew the soldiers of John, and then went on a flight around Ireland into Scotland uh, through the Isle of Man and was finally captured. Uh, she and her son were imprisoned and starved to death. Now this crucible of tyranny resulted in all the barons getting together and using their system of castles uh, to defend the rights of the people against John. And ultimately they came up with the Magna Carta, which another is another document on which our uh, system of governance is founded. From there we go to Henry VIII and uh, the idea of one's conscience being one's own. So that undertakes the, the story of Thomas More, the splitting of the church, and everyone's right to their own beliefs. From there, we venture to America and the founding of the country, which was based not on uh, a feudal level where you, everyone has a lord, but each person is their own lord. Each person decides what land they want to till uh, and what, what, how their children are educated, uh, how their church is built, uh, all sorts of things that I call the Arch of America, and it has to do with the individual, the family, one's faith, one's property, one's enterprises, and uh, one's associations, which are in America are all freely born and, and were so for the first time in America. I go through the, the uh, battle, some of the key battles of the revolution and how that formed our founding. I go to the creation of the Constitution in America and how it took elements of Israel Greece, Rome, and England to create. Okay. Uh, then I then I go to the Civil War, and as you know, we all know, at our founding in the Constitution, it, the Constitution was compromised. Why? Because there were people among our population that were treated as lesser and unequal, and being in fact two fifths, uh, three fifths of the value of a person. So we had to go through the bloodiest uh, Civil War in uh, in human history where with a, it had no president in history, uh, a race in the majority went to war with itself to free a population in the minority. And out of some 1,500,000 casualties that comprises those who were wounded, missing, or killed, uh, we created a better government that was not compromised. When was it that the British government eliminated absolute rule for the king and created their constitutional monarchy? That's a great question. It was the English Civil War, and that is also treated with in the book. Uh, and it, it ended with William and Mary taking the throne from James II and creating what they call the Glorious Revolution. Uh, and in that revolution, uh, there were many more demands made upon, well, it confined the king from his divine right into being uh, a more of an executive like our presidency is. And giving power, absolute power was given to the People's Assembly, the House of Commons. The Parliament, right. Right, right. So what year was that? 1688. Okay, so from then on, the, the kings and queens had less absolute power. Correct. Correct. They were the antithesis of uh, the person in France, Louis the Fourteenth, who was the absolute sun king and monarch. Uh, England took a different trail, uh, and that was uh, to representative government. I assume that when Louis the Sixteenth was beheaded, that was the <laughs> end end of the monarchy in France. <laughs> no, actually, uh, Douglas, it merely changed hands. What happened was oh. they went into a they they went into a tyranny of the mob. Uh, earmarked by Robespierre and his reign of terror. Uh, 
at the guillotine. And what happened was they just eliminated all the aristocracy and what filled the void of the uh, monarch and the aristocracy was Napoleon and his favorites. And it became a military uh, tyranny. More, um, I would say the individual had more rights under Napoleon, but it was again the same system of absolute control over a population. Mm -hmm. They have still not yet uh, in France, they don't have uh, what I would deem a democracy because there is a massive administration that uh, pretty much dictates who's going to win or lose in the marketplace and dictates what everybody can and can't have hmm. through a massive re redistribution of wealth. Okay. Well, I think that's a conversation for a different day. Yeah, it's a, it's a long one. <laughs> yeah. Um, very quickly, we're kind of running out of time okay. here. Okay. How does your book relate to what's going on in this country now? Well, what I've done in this is volume one of a three volume series. I'm right in the middle of volume two, which will come out in March. What volume one does is set down the underpinnings of why America is precisely the way America is or was up until 1920. Volume two will treat what what has occurred in America from 1920 to today. And then volume three will be it'll be called the uh, human dynamics in democracy and be more uh, essay based rather than history based. Okay, super. Do you have a website you want to share? I do. It's uh, richardclyons.com. And it has a sister site, which is lilia.com, which is spelled L-Y-L-E-A.com. Okay. And people can find your book there and find information about you? and Yeah, they can find uh, my biography and uh, works I've produced, written, published. Uh, and then the Lilia site is more a store where you can pick up products. Okay, super. Thanks so much for coming on. I know this wasn't long enough, but uh, gives people a little taste of what they can find in your books. I think it'll be uh, interesting for them. Yeah, yeah it's gotten some uh, really good reviews. I made it a very readable text. It's not, it's not a textbook. It's, it's more narrative based. So yeah. I think people will, will enjoy it and have fun and learn a lot. I well, hope that's that's <laughs> what we're here for, at least.